Hey there cats and kitties, I am the Blues Man, Johnny Blues, and with this video I'll be discussing my thoughts on Kingsglaive Final Fantasy XV, a full-length CGI feature film meant to coincide with the upcoming Final Fantasy XV game release. And uh, as somebody who has been a long-time Final Fantasy fan and Final Fantasies VII and VIII, respectively, really getting me into uh, my anime fandom, especially if you look at the character designs for Final Fantasy VII. You know, I've played VII, VIII, IX, X, uh, X-2, twelve, and uh, Tactics, which I never beat, um, you know, so... And I've always wanted to go back and play the earlier games, uh, you know, six and, and three and such like that. Um, I really wanted to jump into this because I really thoroughly enjoyed Final Fantasy The Spirits Within as well as Final Fantasy VII Advent Children, uh, the two previous fully cinematic CGI feature length films uh, by Square. And this one definitely seemed interesting to me, even if I would never probably be able to play Final Fantasy XV. Uh, Thirteen was the last one I, I ended up being able to play only about, you know, just under halfway through it before my PS3 at the time had gone wild, had died, and uh, I was never able to play any of the Final Fantasies beyond that or any of the, uh, you know, sort of multiplayer online ones and such along those lines. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I'm such a big Final Fantasy fan, even though I haven't touched every facet of it, every, uh, you know, title that ha has been in existence since it was, you know, first brought to us. Um, and this movie was actually pretty damn kick-ass, I gotta say. Uh, featuring the voice talents of such actors as Aaron Paul, Sean Bean, Lita Hetty. Uh, for the anime fans among you, you have Todd Habercorn and Wendy Lee showing up in minor roles. Uh, Habercorn's voice stood out to me right away um, because I've become that much more familiar with it through his work on Star Trek Continues, being that I am a Trekkie. Every base is covered, <laughs> you know, Wendy Lee, of course, being the voice of Faye Valentine from Cowboy Bebop, my all-time favorite anime series, and um, it was just a really intriguing story. The entirety of the movie, I mean, there are similar themes to things you've seen before, but all of your favorite things, if you love things like Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, Pacific Rim, um, and some of the character outfits, uh, their, you know, sort of armor and things along those lines. They have hoods. It's it's kind of hearkening to Assassin's Creed. Um, there's so much awesome stuff. They have this warping capability uh, that the main character, Nyx, uses quite often um, where, you know, they throw their sort of blade. It's almost like a Klingon blade. They throw it and they disappear a la, you know, uh, Nightcrawler from the X-Men and then reappear further down the line wherever this blade happens to end up. Whether it's stuck in a wall, <laughs> whether it's in midair, it is the warping thing is all kinds of badass. I, I hope this is something that is actually in the Final Fantasy XV game. If I can ever play it uh, someday in the future, you know, I really can't afford a PS4 and all that kind of stuff. Um, but that is an ability that I would be jealous of if you pop that game in and you just don't have it. I mean, you're basically dealing with these two warring nations, Lucis and Niflheim. Not to be confused with Nibelheim from Final Fantasy VII, although I have seen videos uh, talking about a sort of, you know, fan theory that somehow Final Fantasies VII and XV are connected, whether uh, this is the world that, you know, eventually evolves into VII or vice versa. You know, I don't really take much stock in that, even though there are a lot of visually similar uh, details in the architecture, the way, you know, Insomnia, the main city that is uh, held under Lucian rule, appears in the film and such like that. But, I mean, this is a story of betrayal, that begins with a bloodlusting war and you know basically the Lucian state uh, they they are up against it you know it's not looking all that well to them as they are going up against this you know tyrannical empirical uh, sovereignty that is known as Niflheim and where that betrayal comes in there are twists and turns I don't want to spoil anything give too much uh, detail away but I mean, there is betrayal in the sense that both of these factions come together under a proposition of peace. 
and that's not really what you know all sides are after necessarily there is also internal uh sort of betrayal in, in the sense of revolting uh soldiers within you know the, the lucian cavity and it's it's intriguing because you're following around the king's glaive themselves uh you know the sort of proclaimed hero nix the main character being the, the chief you know focus and sort of without wanting to give too much away of all the intricacies and the twists and turns his mission effectively for all intents and purposes is to rescue the life of and and keep in protection of the princess that you know the king once knew and because this is coinciding with the Final Fantasy XV game, the main character of which will be Noctis Lucas Calum, um, you know, he, there's a proposition of, in order to formalize this piece, we want to see this princess, Luna Freya, who, you know, they, they were childhood friends, she and Noctis, they want to see them wedded. They want to see them, you know, basically become a symbol of the peace that these two nations purport that they want. And so Nyx is very much about keeping her safe, and uh, even as the betrayals start to unfold and the twists and turns take shape, I mean, it's balls to the wall. This entire flick is just all kinds of awesome, and I mean, it was intriguing to me too because, I mean, there's something for everybody, I think, in this film. One of the things that stood out to me is this character, Arden Izunia, um, who is part of the Niflheim faction. And this guy, just the way his demeanor is, he kind of comes across as Tom, like a Tom Baker-like character, uh, very much reminiscent of the fourth Doctor from Doctor Who. And so, I mean, as I'm saying, you know, I have voice artists from Cowboy Bebop, uh, you know, an actor from Star Trek Continues, a Star Trek fan series, you know, great actors like Lena Headey, who uh, harkens back to the uh, TV series based around the Terminator, you know, uh, franchise that I absolutely loved. And Sean Bean, of course, Lord of the Rings, Aaron Paul, I mean just so much going on in this sucker you know and then you got a character that's kind of akin to tom baker he has a very sort of um i don't want to say that he's necessarily overly flamboyant as a character but he has those similar bohemian qualities and his voice you know while not sounding entirely like a tom baker with a, a baritone and uh, a sort of you know british accent that kind of thing he actually kind of reminded me uh you know in his in his voice in his vocalization as being akin to jeremy irons while still having the look of a, of a very fourth doctor-esque character and um you know i mean if anyone out there happens to be a fan of final fantasy star trek anime and doctor who and all that kind of stuff all the things that actually i really love um you know more power to you i applaud you for being similarly uh interested in things and, and such like that um you know one of the, one of the earliest things though in this movie that is a, a minor spoiler I was really disappointed as, as we're following the King's Glaive, we're mostly focusing on Nyx, uh, his buddy Libertus, which is definitely having, you know, reservations about what their king has led them into and certain, uh, you know, formalities that go along the lines of, of attaining this peace. Basically, Niflheim comes in and says, well, look, with the exception of this one city that is the focus of the film, Insomnia, if Lucis gives up all of their, you know, reigning over uh, the rest of the cities of, of this country, of this land, then there will be peace and peace will be achieved successfully. And Libertus is vocally, you know, not thrilled about that. I mean, there's a lot of talk about how they are refugees, how they come from uh, the outlands that, you know, are on the outside of a big protective wall that encapsulates this city of insomnia. And a lot of the uh, sort of people who are born there and born within the walls, uh, the protective walls, you know, they look down upon the King's Glaive because they're, they're almost like fodder in this war. And uh, one of the characters who's a standout from the beginning, I, I believe she has like mage-like powers, even though it, it seems as though uh, with the warping, the teleporting capability and certain like force lightning a la Star Wars, um, you know, stuff like that. It seems like more than one of the characters actually has magic capability, and there's discussion to the point that this magic harkens from the crystal that is uh, the sort of, you know, central figure that keeps Insomnia safe. Uh, it's empowered by the king and vice versa, and that gets into a whole 
interesting, you know, like the gods of this world, if you think about the summonable gods in a Final Fantasy game, the Lucii, they're called, um, and you actually get to see some of these gods, these Lucii, um, they, they kind of resemble summons, as I say, like along the lines of Odin from Final Fantasy VIII and uh, Yojimbo from Final Fantasy X and even Shiva a little bit um, with, with a female one. This this power, this magic seems to emanate from them through the king. And so these other characters also who are part of the king's glaive have this power. And this chick, Crow, is one of the first characters you meet uh, as a part of almost like the, the triumvirate focus. And unfortunately, her fate is ill-fated. Um, she is taken out of the story much sooner than I would have wished for because I thought she was an intriguing character and... and uh, I would have loved to have learned more about her with sort of the bickering that's going on between Nyx and Libertus where they're not quite seeing eye to eye and she's sort of the in-between, um, that kind of stuff. I mean, it, this movie is just all kinds of badass. And one of the really intriguing things, hearkening back to what I mentioned earlier about a, a sort of fan theory that there could be a link between Final Fantasy VII and XV, respectively, is that one of the demons um, that is, you know, utilized by Niflheim in this attack at the beginning of the film, and you also see this uh, creature showing up again toward the end of the film, is a giant, uh, you know, basically weapon from Final Fantasy VII. I mean, it looks like exactly like one of the weapons from Final Fantasy VII. And that was exciting to me. I loved all of these little, you know, sort of hallmarks of the Final Fantasy series, the franchise overall, where each individual game is its own story, its own world, uh, unless you have like a, a Final Fantasy X and Final Fantasy X-2, or Final Fantasy XIII and XIII-2, you know those are direct continuations in the world that was set up in, in the first installment of that particular series, whereas you don't really need to worry about that, um, you know, but there are still crossover hallmarks, things like uh, Chocobo references. There, there's a speedy Chocobo delivery service van you see, and uh, one of the characters describes, uh, you know, like like food as being nothing better than a Chocobo turd. And uh, the idea that you have a giant weapon, as you would see in Final Fantasy VII, you know, and then there are music cues that are great. There's an, uh, a sort of militaristic march that you hear toward the middle of the film where both of these nations are, you know, in that purported uh, peace talk, <laughs> you know, that's basically going on. And you hear that march and it's just like Nobuo Uematsu's uh, original scoring going all the way back to one of the earliest Final Fantasy games. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm just uh, I'm <laughs> riding the rails of excitement. I just got done watching this film. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. Thought it was all kinds of badass. I could see, honestly, how it might not be everybody's cup of tea, but I just thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, being a, a very, like I say, longtime Final Fantasy fan, a fan of the franchise, a fan of their feature film endeavors, love it or hate it, um, you know, they are uh, very much akin to this film. Not everybody's cup of tea, but I love them. And I just thoroughly enjoyed this movie. And uh, it definitely leaves me, because there is a post-credits sequence that is much more directly tied to the characters in the Final Fantasy XV game that will be, you know, soon to be uh, debuting. It definitely leaves me wishing I could play that game and I could experience what those characters are going through and see where this all culminates and where this all aligns between the film, its characters, and those characters respectively and uh, so yeah i love to hear from you guys in the comments below if you're a fan of final fantasy the franchise overall if you're a fan of any of the previous films advent children the spirits within as i am um i know there have been a couple of anime endeavors as well uh whether you know ovas or short subjects uh, to an entire series called final fantasy unlimited which i never actually watched and or if you've seen this film, if you have interest in this film, if you haven't seen it, love it or hate it, anything goes in the comments below. Just love having that conversation, and I'd love to hear from you. Um, one final note I want to mention is the character that this is all kind of central around, even though Nyx, the Kingsglaive hero, is the main focus of the story, the princess herself, Luna Freya. I thought it was really interesting that you have a name like Luna Freya, and of course there was a Freya in Final Fantasy IX, um, who was a dragoon. I thought it was really interesting that her her character design 
really harkened back to me Tara Branford from Final Fantasy VI, a game that I only ever got to play a few minutes into, maybe a, a couple hours into, something along those lines. Uh, a few minutes by the length of the game, no doubt. Um, and I always meant to go back to, but unfortunately I had to sell my copy of, so I was never able to. But I just thought that was interesting. Another hallmark of the franchise that is Final Fantasy, having a character that visually harkens back the look of a Terra Branford. And like I say, the weapons and the music cues and all the cool stuff, the Chocobo <laughs> references, everything like that. Uh, so yeah, enough of my rambling, enough of my yapping. Let's hear from you guys in the comments below what you thought of this film, if you've seen it. And if you're going to be checking it out at your earliest opportunity, if you haven't. Otherwise, that'll be pretty much it for me on this. Hope this video finds you well. And I'll catch you all later. Peace.